surprised if you're surprised. Oh, come on, people, it's natural. Today, Victoria smashes testing and vaccination records as the state races to contain a growing outbreak. It's the city of most concern in Australia for um, explosions of cases. Also ahead, the European Union approves the Pfizer vaccine for children over 12. A vaccination campaign ramps up in Papua New Guinea as the country fights surging COVID-19 case numbers. And... Well, it might be a quiet night, but that's a big moment. The Demons reaffirm their premiership credentials with a convincing win over the Western Bulldogs. Hello, welcome to ABC News. Victoria has recorded five new locally acquired cases of coronavirus in the past 24 hours, with the outbreak linked to Melbourne's northern suburbs now at 35. Reporter Leanne Wong is in Melbourne. It's now at the third consecutive day that the uh, hotline has crashed just due to the sheer number of people now wanting to get the vaccination in the wake of this outbreak that started in Melbourne's north, as well as after the government expanded eligibility to include people aged 40 to 49. However, that isn't the only tech issue that the government has been grappling with today. I'm currently outside the Royal Exhibition Building, which is one of the state's mass vaccination sites. And you can see behind me a huge line has formed. It stretches around the entire perimeter of the building down to the road and that's after tech issues forced the booking system offline meaning no one here was able to get vaccinated for about a two-hour period now as of just an hour ago the booking system has been brought back online and we have seen people start to slowly trickle back in but the backlog that workers are now trying to grapple with means that this site is now no longer accepting any walk-ins it's just bookings only and that's the same for the Melbourne Convention Centre further down the road which was also hit by similar tech issues and is also not accepting any walk-ins. Now, we did speak to a couple people here who were, have patiently been waiting in line for their vaccination. Let's take a listen to what they had to say. The incompetence of the administration around this doesn't exactly encourage me to have the jab today. You can run airlines and you can run international concerts and all sorts of things and you can't run a vaccination program without it crashing. Oh, it's been pretty poor. Um, you know, we, I, I got here early, thought I was doing the right thing, but, um, you know, obviously the IT systems have played a big part in that. The Chief Health Officer has warned that it is too early to be confident about the case numbers from yesterday. So where does the cluster stand today? So after Victoria recorded another five new locally acquired cases, as you mentioned, well, the cluster now stands at 35. And across the state, there are 45 active cases, including those uh, in hotel quarantine who are international travellers. Travellers Now, there have been some good numbers to come out of uh, yesterday. We've seen some more record-breaking tests as well as vaccinations. So more than 56,500 people were tested in the past day, which really smashes our old record out of the water, which was previously 47,000. We've also seen 21,000 people vaccinated at state-run sites just like the one I'm currently outside. However, the number of public exposure sites just keeps growing. We've now passed more than 150 public exposure sites after another 20 Tier 1 sites were added to the list overnight after authorities revealed that someone who works at a food distribution plant was working during their infectious period. Now, they visited a number of food and grocery stores over a nine-day period in Melbourne's outer north. So that includes suburbs such as Epping, Willers, uh, Caram Downs, and the authorities are obviously quite concerned about that. Now, they also mentioned yesterday that there are now 15,000 primary and secondary contacts, and because of that, they've requested 160 additional ADF personnel to come to Victoria to help with their door knocking efforts so they, 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 that they can double check that these contacts are actually at home and isolating where they should be. But we are now in our second day of lockdown. Everyone is obviously hoping that these numbers uh, won't continue to increase in the coming days. However, we did hear earlier from epidemiologist Mary Louise McClaws, who says that she doesn't believe that seven days may be long enough and Victorians should brace for more cases. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. 
we probably won't hear more cases for a while, or at least um, an uptick, but I expect an uptick. In uh, the northern beaches, when there was an outbreak, it took about six days to get to about 30. Uh, it's only taken four days in Melbourne. And then it continued because of a very close, uh, knit community. And the same thing happens in Melbourne. It's a very close, knit community. It's a city that's easy to get around. Uh, and therefore, it's sadly <laughs> easy to spread. So it's one, it's the city of most concern in Australia for um, explosions of cases. Now, obviously, when Melbourne does eventually emerge from lockdown, that will be dependent just on the number of cases that we see in the coming days. Leanne Wong there. We are expecting to hear from the Victorian government later on this hour. We will, of course, bring you that news conference live on the ABC News channel when it begins. Meantime, New South Wales Health has recorded its highest ever number of COVID-19 vaccines in one day. More than 14,000 people received their jabs yesterday, bringing the total number of vaccines administered in the states to 1.25 million. There have been no new locally acquired cases of COVID-19 reported in New South Wales in the 24 hours to 8 o'clock last night, with one new case in hotel quarantine. 17,000 tests were reported in the same period, down slightly on the day before. Regional Victorians are no longer allowed into South Australia unless they live within 70 kilometres of the border. People who have travelled into the state from regional Victoria since 7pm on the 26th of May will now also be required to get a Covid test and remain isolated for 14 days. The state's chief public health officer says the new direction takes into consideration the impact of travel restrictions on border communities. Returning residents and essential travellers are permitted to enter from Victoria, but must get tested and isolate for two weeks. The federal opposition has criticised the government for a lack of support for new quarantine facilities around the country. Prime Minister Scott Morrison previously committed to increasing the capacity of the Howard Springs facility in the Northern Territory from 800 to 2,000 by the end of May. He has also indicated support for a proposed quarantine facility in Victoria, but has been less favourable on a proposal near Toowoomba. Anthony Albanese says there's a clear need for more facilities. And the government has had more than a year to get its act together. And yet Scott Morrison, it's taken another outbreak for him to say that, yes, we need to do something perhaps on other appropriate quarantine facilities. Turning overseas, the European Union's medicines regulator has approved the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine for children aged between 12 and 15. Up until now, it was only allowed its use in teenagers aged 16 and over. The decision will need to be formally approved by the European Commission and then by individual member states. The COVID-19 vaccination programme has begun in Papua New Guinea as case numbers there continue to increase. Health authorities are facing challenges amid high levels of misinformation about the vaccine, as well as difficulties in social distancing and mask wearing. Jack O'Shea, the programme manager at Australian Doctors International in Papua New Guinea, says the geographic location has also caused difficulties. The moving day average has dropped below 50 now, so we have seen a significant improvement there. Um, it was at some points about 200 to 300 a day, so there has been some form of improvement. The current cases in total sit around about 15,200, um, which does you know, actually show that slowdown. But the good thing is that 23,000 people, including about 5,000 health workers and other essential workers, have been vaccinated. So, and that's over about 60 sites out of 182 that PNG are aiming to get to. Um, so a great improvement from last time we spoke a month ago, but there's still a lot of work to do. Look, geographically, um, as we know, PNG is, is very difficult to do max vaccine rollouts or rollouts of any, any sort. Um, I guess another thing would be the misinformation that we're facing within Papua New Guinea, also it, especially within the remote communities where messaging can come, sometimes get a little bit confusing. Um, but I guess we see that in Australia too. Um, we see hesitancy, we see... Um, I guess worries about side effects and potential clotting with the AZ um, vaccine, which is 
being rolled out in PNG. Um, I can happily say that I've had my two AZ vaccines and feel completely fine and ready to help the people on the ground in PNG. The National Department of Health and the National PNG government more widely are, are sort of taking a couple of different tacks on that. Um, one, for example, has been engaging local champions like um, you know, high-level religious leaders, um, you know, high-level medical doctors and running campaigns in collaboration with partners such as WHO or Australian Doctors International, who I work, and using that information to make people have informed decision-making, because that's the most important thing. I think no matter where you live um, in these trying times, access to legitimate information is incredibly important. Japan has extended its state of emergency by another three weeks in the capital Tokyo and in eight other areas, less than two months before the Olympics are due to start. The COVID state of emergency was scheduled to finish at the end of this month, but has been lengthened due to the severe strain currently on the country's medical system. The state of emergency bans restaurants from serving alcohol and requests they close by 8 o'clock at night. Prime Minister Suga says the next three weeks will be key to speeding up vaccinations and stopping the coronavirus infections spread. The next three weeks are an extremely important period in achieving results of infection prevention and vaccine inoculation, a two-sided strategy. To hold the Olympics, the IOC, IPC and Tokyo will continue to proceed with adjustments and as a country, we will fully cooperate to protect people's lives. While preventing the infection, we will increase vaccine inoculations, facing an unprecedented challenge so that we can return to a safe and secure lifestyle as soon as possible. At least 300,000 people are now known to have died in India's second wave of coronavirus, with many likely to be the dead, with May likely to be the deadliest month so far. But the true death toll could be several times higher, especially in rural areas where the virus is now spreading. Funeral pyres are now a prism for the pain of a nation. He is lost in grief for his mother one of the latest victims of COVID-19 in the state of Bihar. With so many dead across India, cremation costs have soared. Some families here have been reduced to entrusting the bodies of their loved ones to the sacred waters of the Ganges. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whose ratings are falling, has been remembering the dead. <laughs> with a show of emotion. But within hours, crocodile tears was trending on social media here. The full scale of India's tragedy may never be known. We crossed the Ganges to reach the vast hinterland. In rural areas like the village of Birpur, we found a landscape of neglect and untold stories. So can you tell me, are, are many families affected here? Yes, yes, many families affected here. Many, uh, many people's death. Every, every home, many people get a fever and cough, but no test. No social distancing either, and no masks in sight. This is the other India, not rising, but left behind. People here say the living are barely counted, much less the dead. We've been told that 26 people have died here with symptoms of COVID-19 in the past month, but none of them were actually tested. That means they're not included in India's official death toll from the virus. Now, this is just one village, but you can multiply this across India. Take a look at the village health centre. Imagine having to rush here in an emergency. It's an empty shell, carefully padlocked. This neglect is not unusual in rural India. It takes three hours to get to a hospital. Many can't afford the journey. The village leader, Arun Kumar Rai, has lost neighbours and friends. He blames the Prime Minister. 
कोरोना के समय भी जनता को आत्मनिर्भर पर छोड़ दिए मोदी जी जिसका नतीजा है कि इस पोजीशन पर महामारी गया व्यवस्था यदि उस तरह के किया जाता कहीं हॉस्पिटल बनाया जाता तब इस तरह का चपेट में नहीं पड़ता चारों तरफ से फैले कहीं कुछ नहीं हो और लोग तराही मामी करके मर रहे हैं महामारी में When we returned to Birpur for a second day, health workers had been dispatched to the village. A local source told us the visit was a token gesture because we had been on the ground. Hello. Hi, we are from BBC News. Health worker Malti Kumari finally had some vaccines. <laughs> लोग नहीं आ रहे हैं कि हमको बुखार लग जाता है वैक्सीन लेने से मार रहा है जान के ये लोग मार रहे हैं। So she waited in vain. There is vaccine hesitancy in the village, but in much of the country, there's no vaccine to be had. Covid has cut across India like a scythe, bringing anguish for the living and indignity for the dying. and for the prime minister the accusation of failing his people Russian president Vladimir Putin has given his support to his Belarus counterpart Alexander Lukashenko over the grounding of a passenger jet to arrest a political activist The European Union and NATO have accused Belarus of piracy after the Ryanair flight was forced to land in the capital Minsk The journalist and his girlfriend are now in jail accused of orchestrating mass riots in Belarus. Mr Putin, a close ally of Mr Lukashenko, gave his support during a meeting in the Red Sea resort of Sochi and says the West's reaction to the incident was an outburst of emotion. The EU has since urged Europe-based airlines to avoid Belarusian airspace. With more people shopping online than ever before, supermarkets are trying to keep up with demand and the big chains think they have found an answer. Robots. Automated warehouses are already transforming the delivery process in Britain and they could become a fixture here in Australia. But there are warnings about what it means for the workers who are being replaced. To Europe correspondent Linton Besser reports. The greengrocer of the future is coming to Australia, but he's not human. And he's not alone. So we're looking at um, our robots, over 2,000 of them currently. These robotic warehouses are now under construction for coals in Sydney and Melbourne. 130,000 customer orders being picked each week. Each customer order is roughly speaking 50 items. We're picking over 1.1 million items a day through this facility. Technology has already radically transformed this workplace, and further reductions in costly headcount is one of the company's central aims. We're always looking at opportunities to, to remove the more manual jobs, um, the more monotonous jobs from the process. Mass automation has eliminated thousands of jobs, but perhaps more significant is how the nature of work has changed for those lucky enough to still be employed. Well, I think this is the most worrying thing, that we found that it's the work of these um, so-called lower skill, low paid um, and vulnerable workers have, have been intensified. Anna Thomas has just released a major report which raises grave questions about the implications of mass automation on society. And the more human elements, the judgment, the agency of what they're doing is slowly shaved off. Many of those who still have jobs in these warehouses now follow orders issued by an algorithm. So in the background, the AI has already decided what products should go in which containers for which customers. Ocado's James Grolton says his company is simply responding to consumer demand for convenience that's only intensified during the pandemic. By taking away some of that decision making, yes, they can move faster, but we know that they as a customer and the customers receiving that order are going to be happy with what we've done for them. These workers pick as many as 500 items per hour, but Ocado is now designing a machine to replace them too. It's absolutely legitimate to think of your customer, but it's not absolute. And these systems shouldn't be designed or deployed without really any regard or understanding for the impacts they have on people and society. 
As the coronavirus pandemic continues to change the way we live and work, perhaps it's worth asking ourselves, what price convenience? Linton Besser, ABC News, London. One third of us would rather spend time with pets instead of people. That is the latest finding from the Australia Talks National Survey, which also reveals a link between loving furry friends and loneliness. Reporter Stephanie Dalzell looks at the benefits of animal companionship. Movie nights look a little different in the Brock household. The smallest members of the family are more interested in the snacks. Jodie Brock has 60 pet rats. They just get you. <laughs> you don't have to explain your day um, and, and they make good, you know, they're awesome. While Jodie's choice of animal might be unusual, her choice of family is not. Almost a third of us would rather spend time with our furry friends than human beings. And women are much more likely to prefer animals to people. I don't have to get dressed up, I don't have to do my hair, I don't have to do makeup, and they don't care. <laughs> not doing your hair is not an option for Cassandra Hilton's three dogs. Every few weeks they're pampered at this doggy day spa. Boy, pets just give you a sense of wellness and happiness. Um, they, you know, they give you a sense of love. Pets can chase away stress, improve well-being and even lower blood pressure. But what about loneliness? The Australia Talk survey found that 14% of people reported feeling lonely frequently or always and they were more likely to prefer pets to people. There are people who actually will use their pets um, as a source of companionship. Michelle Lim is a loneliness expert and pet lover. She says there's a growing body of evidence to suggest loneliness can increase a person's risk of health issues. Social interactions can also be very stressful for lonely people, which is where pets can offer support. That can actually produce feelings of calmness and happiness and joy uh, when they actually interact with the pets as opposed to interacting with uh, people. Demand for pets surged during the pandemic. The rats at Jodie Brock Breeds were climbing out the door as her customers looked for low maintenance pets. A lot of those that have had mental health issues that we do keep in contact with have said, look, these animals have saved, saved my life. <laughs> Cuddly companions responsible for much more than curing COVID blues. Stephanie Dalzell, ABC News. I'll stick with the puppy, I think. It's time for the sport now. Here's Jared Coote. The Melbourne Demons have moved to the top of the AFL ladder after beating the Western Bulldogs by 28 points. The Demons were completely dominant in the top of the table clash. Melbourne bounced back from that shock. One point loss to Adelaide the week before with a 87-59 victory at an empty Dockland Stadium with fans forced to stay home due to Melbourne's COVID-19 lockdown. Bailey Fritch and Tom McDonald booted three goals each for Melbourne while Sam Wiedemann kicked two. Yeah, I think just in terms of the opposition, you know, we, we knew we were playing against a quality side and you know, their ability to transition the ball from inside to outside has been really strong. So, you know, our ability to defend strongly and, and win enough contests and be efficient going forward was clearly on show for the, for the majority of the night. And um, you know, I was just really proud of the boys, the way they went about it. You know, it wasn't the perfect week, but their ability to deal with that maturity shown and their ability to execute what we were trying to do was outstanding. The West Tigers have announced the signing of English international Oliver Gildart from next season, just hours after recording a win overnight. The Tigers' early game, North Queensland, beat the New Zealand Warriors 29-28 after a last-minute field goal from Valentine Holmes. Jack DeBellin's playing for the first time tomorrow in two and a half years, so, um, you know, that, that's furthest thing from our minds at the moment. We're, you know, bitterly disappointed with... With what we did tonight, we've done a lot of good things. And I thought last week, even though it wasn't the greatest game of the world, um, we did a lot of good things and should have won that game. But tonight, you know, clearly we, we let ourselves down. 
Hash Barty says she has no problem talking to the media during the French Open. The world number one was speaking in relation to Naomi Osaka's decision to not conduct any interviews during the tournament to protect her mental health. Now, Barty says she has no issue conducting interviews mid-tournament. Oh, I think, it, in, in my opinion, um, press is, is kind of part of the job. We know what we sign up for as, as professional tennis players and I can't really comment on what Naomi's feeling or, or on her decisions that she makes. But um, at times, press conferences are hard, of course, but it's also not something that, that bothers me. Um, you know, I've, I've never had problems um, answering questions or being completely honest with you guys. It's not, it's not something that's ever uh, fazed me too much and, um, you know, certainly doesn't, doesn't for me personally, doesn't, doesn't keep me up at night. The Western Force are yet to win in the Super Rugby Trans-Tasman competition from three attempts after going down to the Hurricanes. The Force lost 43-6 against the New Zealand side who remain undefeated in the competition. That's despite winning just two matches in the Super Rugby Aotearoa New Zealand based competition. The Hurricanes scored seven tries to none in the bonus point victory. Australian sides are yet to earn a win in the Trans-Tasman competition. The Waratahs, Brumbies and Reds all play later today. On the satellite, a deep trough and front is triggering heavy rain and storms over western WA. A low over the Tasman is generating large surf to New South Wales and southeast Queensland. A high in the southeast is keeping elsewhere dry. Looking around the country, Queensland will be mostly cloudy, cool to mild in the southeast, mostly sunny and warm in the north, mostly cloudy in the southwest. In New South Wales and the ACT, windy and cool in the northeast, mostly cloudy and cool in the northwest, sunny and cold in the south. Victoria will be mostly sunny and cold in the south and northwest, fog then sunny, cold in the northeast. Down to Tasmania, mostly cloudy and cold in the south, windy on the highlands, mostly sunny elsewhere. Mostly sunny and cold in southeast and central South Australia, sunny and mild in the west. In WA, showers and storms for the south, rain and cool to mild in the northwest, mostly sunny and warm in the northeast. And for the Northern Territory, mostly sunny and warm in the top end, clearing showers in Arnhem, sunny and cool to mild over the interior and south. Looking ahead to tomorrow's forecast for the capital cities, Brisbane, mostly sunny. A possible shower for Sydney, Canberra, early frost and then sunny. Melbourne, mostly sunny. Hobart, mostly cloudy. Adelaide, sunny. Thunderstorms for Perth and Darwin will be mostly sunny, a top of 31. And this is where ABC TV viewers are leaving us. We're standing by for the daily Victorian government press conference that will be on the ABC News channel.